In Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, we read Jesus saying these words. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The law, with a capital L, was known by the Jewish people of Jesus' day and by Jesus himself as Torah. If you have Jewish friends, you've probably come across that word. Torah refers specifically to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Torah was cherished as God's supreme gift to his people. It told them who they were, told them how to live, and it marked them out as a unique people among all the peoples of the world. To this very day, the Jewish people and their observance of Torah stand out from every other culture, and that was even more so the case back in Jesus' day, when to be religious meant to worship gods and to have gods meant to have statues and put statues in temples. And here was the one people who worshiped the God who could not be seen, the God who, for whom you could not make a statue. In fact, by Jesus' time, many Jewish people had come to see that if the Torah was the place where, if the temple, excuse me, if the temple was the place where Torah made its home, any place where you studied Torah might become an alternative temple. It's a powerful thought that by picking up a Bible or by sitting in a synagogue service and hearing the words read or by memorizing, which many people did in those days, memorizing large portions of God's Word and then thinking about them and meditating upon them, it was as if you had gone all the way to Jerusalem to the, to the holiest place in the world, to the Jerusalem temple itself, and were sitting in the presence of God. See, we, it's impossible for us to, under, to, to overvalue Torah in terms of what Jesus was talking about when he talked about Torah, the law and the prophets. But now here's a new teacher who's come on the scene. He's announcing that God has at long last come back to dwell with his people. And before he describes what it means to live as God's children in this new reality, he's going to anchor himself and everything he has to say in Torah. So what would that look like? Not abolishing the ancient law, but fulfilling it, bringing it to its accomplishment. What on earth was Jesus talking about? Jesus, after all, was a very different kind of teacher from the other religious or Torah teachers of his time. The typical teachers of Torah, from the village rabbi to the scholars in Jerusalem, spent most of their time debating how the laws in the ancient books fit their day-to-day -day immediate situation. One rabbi would propose that in a given situation, you would have to do things this way because of what Moses said. Another rabbi would come up and say, oh no, that's not the way it has to be, and would offer a different opinion. And back and forth they would go. I think one rabbi has said, you get two rabbis together and you get three opinions. <laughs> and they would go back and forth, pouring over the ancient scrolls, making little incremental suggestions or changes or, or applications to the law, always connecting the present, you understand, with the past. Now here's a rabbi saying, do not think I've come to abolish Torah or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what's the difference between adding a new paragraph to generations of interpretation on the one hand and fulfilling Torah on the other? Nobody else claimed to be fulfilling it. They were simply applying it to a situation that maybe hadn't come up before, offering a new slant by making connections with this verse and that verse and what this person said and that person said. Now here comes a rabbi who said, I'm going to fulfill the entire Torah. Well, we might find an answer to what it means to fulfill Torah in a little creature that we often see crawling across the pavement on a warm autumn or even spring day, the woolly bear caterpillar. How many of you have dodged a woolly bear caterpillar this year? I'm going to ask how many ran over one. <laughs> woolly bears are those fuzzy caterpillars that are black at both ends 
and rust red in the middle. Now, folklore says you can predict the severity of the winter by the size of the red band in the middle. That is to say, whether it's wide or whether it's very, very narrow. But in any event, woolly bears are amazingly suited for the harshest of winters. And when it gets cold, their bodies, they curl up in a hiding place. I find that they like my wood pile. And uh, I discover them in the middle of the winter. They're still there, all curled up. And what they do is they get into their hiding place, and as the days get colder, the nights get colder, their bodies begin to produce an antifreeze as to protect their cells from freezing. This antifreeze is effective down to minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So whether they're telling us what the winter's going to be or not, they're ready for it. In the spring, they wake up, crawl around, eat some dandelions, spin a cocoon, and two weeks later, they emerge as a tiger moth. And there you have your tiger moth. Look at a woolly bear, and you would never know that it was destined to be a beautiful moth. But the woolly bear was never intended to only ever be a woolly bear. The woolly bear was always intended to be a tiger moth. When the woolly bear spins its cocoon and stops being a caterpillar, it is not abolishing itself. It looks like it went away. You open up the cocoon, you won't find a caterpillar. In fact, you'll never see the woolly bear caterpillar out of that creature ever again. But it's not abolishing itself. It's just doing what it has to do to fulfill itself and its destiny. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying when he explained that he did not come to abolish the law, Torah, all of the traditions of Judaism that God had given to his people, but rather to fulfill the law. He was saying that God's Torah, God's gift, God's word that had sustained and defined the Jewish people for so many centuries and through so many hardships was itself about to change. Change would not be through another rabbi adding another footnote of interpretation here and there, another clever connection being made, another argument that would run for two or three generations. The change would be as profound as the difference between a caterpillar creeping across the pavement and a moth flying through the trees. That's a radical difference, but so totally connected. Therefore, no matter how alarming the changes might seem to be, the things that Jesus would say about the law, the things that Paul later on would say about the Jewish law, no matter how much it might look like Jesus was going against the ancient rules, the reality was that Torah was about to become something even more wonderful. God's rescue of the human race that had begun in one exclusive little people group called the Hebrews would soon embrace all the peoples of the world. And instead of God's rescue mission being pinned down to one language group and one ethnic group and one physical place, never really able to spread because if it spread too quickly or too fast, that group would lose its identity. Instead, God's rescue mission would take wings, be there for you and for me and for people all over this planet regardless of what they looked like, regardless of their language, regardless of their religious heritage or their culture, it would be there for everybody. Now, Jesus goes on to reinforce the continuity between the law as it was received and the fulfillment of the law in what I would call a sort of divine constant. Jesus is going to say, look, inside this law that we've all memorized and learned and that we all have learned to keep in so many situations, is something that never changes. Listen to what he says in verse 19. Therefore, if anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Remember, he said, I'm not going to abolish the law. I'm going to fulfill it. There's a huge change coming, but let's anchor this in the reality that what God gave, God never takes back. We're just going to find out what it really means. Jesus is about, in chapter 5 here, as Matthew records his teaching, Jesus is about to issue a renewed statement of the Torah. Not a different set of rules, but a deeper set of rules. God's law for God's rule and God's kingdom. This kingdom is not going to look like the expectation of a renewed King David kingdom with loyal and observant Jews. It's going to be a kingdom that has people like you and me in it as well. 
But make no mistake, it's the kingdom of the same God, just in its fulfilled form. And again, I think the woolly bear can help us understand what Jesus was saying when he said not one tiny bit of the law will be lost or changed. The woolly bear began as an egg laid on the back of a leaf somewhere. That egg was laid by a tiger moth that had finished its life cycle had, and was able to reproduce and make sure the next generation would come along. Now, if you were able to, to do microbiology and study that egg, you would find that the DNA inside that little tiny egg was absolutely identical to the DNA inside that fuzzy caterpillar. If you were to open up the, the uh, cocoon that the caterpillar would spin a year or so later, you would find that inside that cocoon was exactly the same DNA as was in the egg in the caterpillar. And when you look at the moth, which looks radically different from all of the other forms that this animal has taken, you still find exactly the same DNA. Nothing has changed. What would happen if you changed the DNA? You would get a mutation, probably a dead animal because it can only become what it needs to become based upon that inner code, something you can't see with your eyes. It would take all sorts of sophisticated equipment to parse out that, that DNA. But we know now we have the privilege in our scientific age of knowing that that's what's going on inside that little creature just as much as it's going inside of you and me. When a woolly bear caterpillar spins its cocoon, it doesn't come out a frog or a robin. It doesn't come out even as a different kind of butterfly. It comes out as the only thing it could ever be, and that is the tiger moth. Because not one tiny command has been changed. You start messing with those little tiny commands and you don't get a good outcome. And I think Jesus is saying the same thing to us. He warns that the true, deep DNA of God's kingdom never changes. That's a lesson we need to keep in our minds in a time when we think of ourselves as being so forward-thinking with new discoveries and questioning of all of the ancient thoughts and ideas and paths. God's DNA never changes. God didn't start something with the human race that basically ran its course. Your Old Testament is not just God's first attempt at getting things right which failed miserably, so he had to add a second covenant and a second testament and a second start for the human race. God knew what he was doing when he created the very first human being. He knew what he was doing when he called a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah. He knew what he was doing when he called a man named Moses to take the project forward. He knew what he was doing when he sent his son Jesus into this world. And while their lives and their ministries look very, very different, and while we look at Jesus dying on a cross and we scratch our heads and say, how could he be the son of David, the king? Because the differences are so extreme. Keep in mind that that little cocoon with a half-dissolved bug inside of it doesn't look anything like the moth that it's going to be in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And nothing like the, the, the caterpillar that crawled around in our yard or maybe across our driveway before it spun the cocoon. The DNA was the same. Jesus says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. To set aside one of the least of these commands is like setting aside some of the DNA of the woolly bear. Corrupted woolly bear DNA results in a dead or mutated moth. Likewise, if we corrupt the DNA of God's kingdom, we miss out on God's kingdom. We may create something interesting. We may create something popular. We may create something that feels right for the moment. We may be very proud of ourselves and of what we've created, but it won't be God's kingdom. It won't have that continuity, and it won't have that life that only God can give. On the other hand, when we fully embrace the deep DNA of God's kingdom, we experience God's transforming power. Like the little woolly bear, we discover that God has something far greater for us than the life we've ever known. We become, as Jesus says, quote, great in the kingdom of heaven, unquote. Not because we're great, 
but because let God, we've allowed God to do a great thing in us, in our relationships, in our church, in everything that we touch in this world. Now, Jesus has one more thing to say about Torah before he begins to spell out what it means in daily life. To give you a preview, if you continue reading from verse 21, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 21 onward, Jesus will begin to talk about the Ten Commandments. And he will give a commandment in its known form, and then he talks about what that means when God is fulfilling Torah in our lives. Let me see how, so see how Jesus sets this up in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a scary verse. There's a verse that could wake you up at night if you were taking your Bible seriously. The Pharisees were a religious group within Judaism. They were the strictest of all the religious groups within Judaism. They believed that the way to bring God home, to bring about God's kingdom, everything Jesus was talking about, was to observe the law perfectly. This is what Paul did. You may remember some of us who were here back during the Easter season studied how Paul said as when it came to the law, he was blameless. Man, he kept all the rules. All the rules about what you could eat or not eat. All the rules about what day of the week you rested and honored God and what holidays you kept. All the rules about circumcising your children and so on. He was very, very careful to keep all the rules. Why? Not because he was trying to earn God's favor. This is sort of a Protestant misunderstanding. And we sort of look at the Jewish people and think, oh, they were just trying to work their way into heaven. That is not the case. They already knew they were God's chosen people. They already knew they were set apart. But what they were trying to do, especially the Pharisees, was show God that they were serious about what God had promised them and what God had called them for. They were wearing the badge of righteousness by saying, look, you gave us these rules, we're doing them. You said take off Saturdays, we take off Saturdays. You said circumcise our male children, we circumcise our male children. Even though nobody else on the planet does so, and they all make fun of us or think we're crazy for doing so, we honor you first. We say our prayers to you. We eat only kosher foods. These were all performance-based things to show God that they were serious and to mark themselves out as this unique people that God had chosen. They were, these were the badges of their tribe, if you will. Jesus says, now, unless you have a righteousness greater than the Pharisees, you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'll tell you, th that to me is an overwhelming statement if you take it the wrong way. Here are some people who are knocking themselves out, much more zealous, much more religious, much more devout, much more ritual focused than I could ever think of being or even care to be. And here's Jesus is saying, you see these guys over here? Bring it up a notch. And it, the, I think most of us would go, huh, I'm not even getting done what I'm trying to do. You remember being in school and you know there's that, always that one student in the class? Bad news for you high school grads, there's going to be one in every one of your college classes too. <laughs> Maybe you're that one. If that's the case, then you're all set. But you know how it is, you knock yourself out. And I remember, oh, man, I worked the hard in math classes. They, I was in this sort of, they didn't call it AP back then, but it was like the math class that was one notch ahead of everybody else. I don't know why they put me in there, but they did. I was in there with a whole bunch of math wizards. And I was not a math wizard. And boy, you know, I mean, I'd fight for my B, and they're getting 100, 100, 100. And I look at that and just, I don't think they're even trying. And maybe you feel that way when it comes to keeping the rules, being righteous, being acceptable to God. Man, you work so hard, and yet at the end of the day, if you're honest with yourself, whew, you know, I got a couple things right, but boy, if God's putting things on the scales. And now Jesus says, up a notch. I don't think so. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I think rather what he's saying is that the righteousness of the Pharisees was in some deep way misdirected. They were trying to live out Torah so as to show that they were exclusively God's people. That meant that the more they lived out Torah, the more they kept the rules, the more they were different from everybody else, 
the less possible it was that God could use them to reach anybody else. I grew up in a very fundamentalist culture where we had things that we couldn't do. We had our own little Pharisee rules. I kept them. We all kept them. You better keep them. <laughs> you didn't keep them. You heard about it. And uh, you risked being shunned by the group. Now, in theory, we were doing all of this so we could win the whole world for Jesus. You know what we were really doing? Turning off the whole world to Jesus. But we felt good about it because we were special. And the more you didn't like us, you'll get yours. You'll get yours. Yep, go ahead, laugh. Some rescue mission, that. That's what Jesus is saying. You guys are knocking yourselves out. But all in the wrong direction. God's plan is to bring in the pagans. People that will never circumcise their little boys. People that will eat their ham sandwiches and their bacon. People who will do church on Sunday instead of Saturday. Torah breakers. All of them. He's going to wrap his arms around them. What did John say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the Pharisees. No. Sins of the cosmos, of the whole world. Jesus is saying the Pharisees, for all their great efforts, were going down the wrong path. Listen to how he puts it in much sterner language. In Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. I don't think that was their intention. I don't think these were evil people. But they'd gotten caught trying to perfect the old instead of going through this radical change that God was doing right before them. It's sort of like a misguided woolly bear who thinks that being a better caterpillar is the fulfillment of its destiny. If I can just eat one more dandelion or one more than everybody else, if I can grow longer, if I can crawl a little faster, if I can get across the interstate without getting squashed, <laughs> if I can just be big, mean, woolly bear, then I'll have achieved my destiny. Call that woolly bear righteousness. The right woolly bear. But woolly bear righteousness will never earn wings. Instead, the woolly bear has to trade in its caterpillar identity for something brand new, that of a tiger moth. Needs to achieve tiger moth righteousness if it's going to become what it was meant to be. And Jesus is saying the same thing is happening here in the human race. As he's talking to God's chosen people, they were being faced with a cocoon moment. The need to be reconfigured around Jesus as king. Only then could they discover the greater righteousness. That status, that whole new identity, not of being better than other people, not some kind of personal rightness that you could parade around, but rather a whole new identity that was immeasurably more wonderful and more important and more purposeful and more what God intended than simply trying to keep a pile of rules. So when Jesus says that our rightness or our righteousness must exceed that of the most strict adherents of the ancient laws, he wasn't saying that we have to try harder than everybody else. That's like asking a woolly bear to fly. A woolly bear may climb the tallest tree, may see a tiger moth flutter past, but if it jumps off and tries to follow, it's going to have the same result as you and me jumping out of the tree. It's going to come back down to the ground. See, Jesus has something far more powerful in mind. Remember he said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets? Well, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, wrote these words in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, 
because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Isn't that interesting how Jesus says least in the kingdom, greatest in the kingdom, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. You see, Jeremiah is describing that woolly bear theology of a caterpillar becoming a beautiful flying moth. He's saying God's going to change his people from the inside out. Instead of giving them more rules to follow, he's going to change their hearts and their minds. He's going to write his law in their hearts. And then and only then can human beings truly reflect their creator. Then and only then can we be what we were made to be. Then and only then can we enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's why I call it woolly bear theology. Something that only happens by letting God transform or metamorphose us. So here's a question for you. Where are you at when it comes to woolly bear theology? Because there's still a little bit of caterpillar in each and every one of us. Are you crawling along, trying to be that better person, comparing yourself to those who seem to soar above you, wondering how you'll ever get your wings? I know there are times in our lives when we just wonder whether we'll ever figure it out, whether we'll ever have that breakthrough. Maybe you're bumping into the same old, same old, anger, lust, fear, self, and all of its various forms. Maybe you're unsure of how God sees you, or if he even sees you at all. Every one of us has those cocoon times because we aren't finished being transformed. God's word says one day we will be. Then we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In the meantime, we spend a lot of time in the cocoon, don't we? Or maybe we need to. Take a moment. Just take a moment and take a look inside and ask yourself, where does God need to write his law in my heart? Because I can promise you as a pastor, as somebody who's done religion for my whole life, my whole adult life, you're never going to figure it out by keeping one more rule. You're not going to figure it out by reading one more book. You're not going to figure it out by having somebody sort of say it in a way that you hadn't thought of before. You go, oh, that's what I was missing. There isn't any trick to this. There isn't any secret to this. There isn't any magic bullet, if you will. There's no fairy dust. But there is transformation. Absolute radical change inside of us. One thought at a time. One memory at a time. Working through all the entanglements of one habit at a time. It's what Jesus called the greater righteousness. The amazing thing is we come out being in that area of our lives what we were meant to be and what we most want to be. And yet, somehow we sense that God was doing something bigger than us just trying to be more religious, more appropriate. I am by no means saying that we should neglect how we talk, how we treat each other. I'm just saying that the motivation is from the heart instead of simply for performance's sake. So where are you at? Where am I at? Each one of us, you know, we're all... In some part of our lives, we're still crawling. We may or may not be able to predict the winter by the stripes on our backs. But God has something bigger for us. He's not going to change the rules. He's not going to change the deep DNA of the human race. He never pastes wings on the backs of caterpillars. He changes little creatures from the inside out, and he changes people from the inside out. Now, we have a term for that that Jesus gave us. It's a term that gets bandied around a lot, and I think sometimes may be misunderstood. It's that simple term being born again. Isn't that what happened to the tiger moth? It was going along, doing its life, and then it curls up in that cocoon, and for all intents and purposes, it's not much going on in there that you can see. And then it comes out as something brand new. That's what God wants to do with you and with me. In fact, Jesus said, 
unless a man or a woman is born again, they cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. The same kingdom he's talking about when he talked about that greater righteousness. Why don't we take a moment here? I'm going to bow our heads together, ask our team to come if they would. And as you just take that reality check and say, Lord, where do I need to be reborn? Some of us here have never perhaps even had that, that experience, at least in a conscious way, in a chosen way, in terms of our following Jesus. But we want to. And today's the day. Today's the day to say, Lord Jesus, I make you my king. Lord Jesus, I understand it's not about being more religious or looking better than anybody else. It's not even about keeping all the rules. It's about letting you come and live inside of me. Take full charge of my life. And you can write what it means to be human in my heart and my mind. Reorient me around yourself and your Father. Birth me brand new. If that's what you want to do and need to do right now, I'd just like to pray that with you. And you can say these words, say them out loud, say them inside your mind. It's between you and God. But it would go like this. And uh, if you'd like to join me, we can pray this together. Dear Lord, I ask to become your child to go into that cocoon and die to my old self. Let you come and live inside of me forever. You paid the price for me. You alone have new life. Come live that life inside of me. Write your laws in my heart. I accept you in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for anyone who is here who is struggling in a particular area where the old has not yet been transformed. And that means all of us. Lord, I pray that you help them just as I pray that you help me come back to you in complete humility and say, Lord, I need you to do that renewing work in this area. Show me what a cocoon moment looks like. Slow me down. Help me to turn away from the paths I've been in. Seek you, what you're saying, and let you write a whole new story on the inside of my heart. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise. And Father, I just want to add one more prayer to this prayer for our graduates today. We thank you for the families, for the parents, the uncles, the aunts, the grandparents, teachers, friends, neighbors. Each person has been a part of these graduates' lives. We thank you for them, for their perseverance, for bringing them safely through to this wonderful moment. And now, Lord, as they, in a way, have their own woolly bear moment of saying goodbye to the past and stepping into a whole new identity, I pray, Lord, that they will find you each step of the way. That you'll be right there beside them. They'll find you for themselves. They will find the answers for their questions, not their parents' questions. They will find your love, your wisdom, the passion for you and for making this world what it was meant to be. And I pray that in each case, Lord, that these young people will be world changers. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. And again, we encourage you to come out back and celebrate. Let's sing if we can. <laughs>